Hello and welcome to Access Chat. I'm delighted that we've been joined today by Yuta Trevioranos, who is joining us from somewhere a little bit more tidy than me. Uh, as you might be able to see, I'm in the middle of renovating a house. So thank you, Yuta. Uh, every time I speak to anyone to do with accessibility in Canada, they always mention your name. So please. Please tell our audience about your background uh, and, and particularly the work that you're doing around accessibility in academia and beyond. Sure, yeah. Um, and it's wonderful to be here. <laughs> wonderful, to, wonderful to be with such a great group. Um, lately, I've been saying that my greatest qualification is 40 years of learning from mistakes and failures. Um, so I, I got into this field over 40 years ago and on reflection, and thanks for this prompt to reflect more on it, um, I think a better statement is likely that I've gained an understanding that the problem that we're all trying to address is far, far bigger than I initially realized. And unless we tackle the bigger problem, we won't really address the more obvious ones in front of us. And um, I've also come to realize that we can't fix or solve some of the really important problems. Um, you need to be vigilant, keep steering, keep cleaning. Proclaiming a fix does harm to people who are still not included. So um, how did I, what do I do and how did I get into this? I think was part of what uh, you were asking. Um, and as is often the story in our field, I became hooked by a bunch of really wonderful people who had so much to say and didn't have a way to say it. Um, in, in the late 70s, my first job out of undergraduate school was to work with 12 people who all face barriers to participating in education. And um, here where I am in Canada, Ontario, we just passed an integration bill. And the pilot that I was supposed to organize included prospective students who had barriers to writing, reading, speaking, entering a classroom, um, all of the things you needed to do to actually participate fully in education. And it just so happened that at exactly the same time, the personal computers came out. And before that, computers were these massive things where you handed in that eight-year cards um, when you handed them in, in and crunched them up and spit them out. And so they weren't something that you could get involved in personally. But all of a sudden, uh, there were these things that came on the market. And so I thought, wow, look at this opportunity. We can use these things to translate. Um, we could take any voluntary action that someone could make and turn it into some, into typing and writing we could or speaking um, we could make things that um, were hard to see or that someone couldn't see into audio etc so wonderful translation devices and so th the other thing about that time was that it was sort of a skunk works it was like the early days of uh, cars when you could just fix your own car you could change your own spark plugs. Um, and so we were able to hack those computer systems and do things that I, some of them have never been replicated. Um, uh, we created, uh, I, I joined something called the um, Rehabilitation Technology Unit and we created some of the things that are still out and about and are still used things like the King keyboard, the mini keyboard, the ability switches, and some things that have never been replicated, uh, including things like scanning and coding systems for people with cerebral palsy. Um, <laughs> anyways, that's the beginning. I've, since then, I've had this crazy, crazy journey through a whole range of things. Um, but the realization that started me off was so optimistic. I thought, wow, here is an opportunity to advance universal design, this time without all of the compromises we had to make before, um, because dis digital systems were sufficiently flexible 
that we could offer one size fits one interfaces rather than one size fits all interfaces, um, which uh, were faced in the constraints of architecture and industrial design. And um, right from the beginning, I knew from experience that disability is about difference, sufficient difference from the average that things don't work for you. And treating people with disability as a homogenous group was denying that people with disabilities are more different from each other than um, people without disabilities. And so um, from that early beginning, I've learned that lesson again and again and again. Um, I, I don't think that you want to hear the entire journey. No. Uh, bit by bit, but, but certainly yeah, so we, 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 we learned as part of the Cognitive Accessibility Task Force, the, the massive divergence of needs amongst <laughs> that, that group of people, you know, um, essentially, it's, a, it's how do you handle conflict because all of the needs are conflicting the whole time. So, so it's, it's really about, as you say, that sort of personalization element. The other thing that I was super interested in is the, that you've been looking into things like um, AI around yeah. AI and accessibility and AI and disability and both the pros and the cons, which is everybody so excited about artificial intelligence, machine learning at the moment, but it's fraught with potential perils for our community, whilst at the same time holding an awful lot of promise for improving, you know, the understanding, the translatability, the, the, the language capabilities, etc. So how, how are you addressing some of that in your work at the moment? Okay, um, well, Back in the 80s, um, I was working on artificial intelligence for dysarthric speech. So how do we use the old style, the, the pre, these amazing machines that have come out, so that um, if you could make an, a repeatable utterance that only your friends and family could understand, that other people could understand it as well. And um, it, we had quite a bit of success. Um, but um, back, or again, then fast forward um, to the 2010s, I was seeing that um, artificial intelligence had sort of changed. And uh, one, of the, um, one of my obsessions has always been um, how we make decisions. Um, and the concern that the way that we make decisions are unfair and um, that the people that um, they're, they're unjust and they ignore as well the potential range of choices that we have. And I've become increasingly infuriated by the pattern of decisions against the people who are already marginalized, how we metaphorically kick people when who are already down. And um, I was horribly distressed when I realized that AI would basically automate, amplify, and accelerate this bias against people who are at the margins and the outliers, because we were, we were basically taking the way that we had already made these unfair decisions and we were mechanizing them. We were taking a hammer and turning it into this power tool. And um, so I was concerned that this way, this unfair way that we were already making decisions was going to become this massive machine that would be pervasive and that we couldn't be, wouldn't be able to address. So um, the, the very galvanizing experience I had was I was invited to test some automated vehicle um, uh, systems, these uh, machines or learning uh, machine models that were going to tell a car whether to stop at an intersection, proceed, uh, change directions. And I thought, okay, let's test this out with um, a capture of a friend of mine who pushes her wheelchair backwards. She's very efficient, very fast. People get confused when she's in an intersection and thinks she's lost control and will try to push her back to the, to the side of the road that she came from. 
Um, and so she, she does unexpected things. She moves unexpectedly. So there was a, a range of these machine learning models, which were all there um, to be tested by the Ministry of Transport. And all of them chose to proceed through the intersection and then effectively, if it had actually been a car, run her over. They all said, don't worry, they're immature. These are the early attempts. Um, once they're smarter, we, this will be addressed. And I said, okay, let's retest once they're smarter. Uh, just remove this learning session. And um, so they, after they all came back with smarter uh, machine learning models that actually had a whole bunch of data about people in wheelchairs proceeding through intersections, the machine learning models um, ran her over with greater confidence. So they were more confident that if you encountered somebody in a wheelchair, they would be moving forward. And so um, that started me in this like um, great alarm that uh, you know something is wrong here. I then went back and tested um, the. I still had the data from the '80s because I'm a. I hoard uh, old things. <laughs> I'm bad at throwing things out, and so I I tested it, and um, the recognition that I had reached early on. Uh, could not be reached with these very, very sophisticated, um, much smarter, much more intelligent voice recognition systems. And the reason is that the the small amount of data that was produced by the people I'd been working with were overwhelmed and lost in the sea of data um, that was being used for recognition. So that uh, then uh, I started to look at, well, how, how do we address this? But um, that led me to realize that this problem doesn't start with AI. It's not an AI problem. AI is just, or artificial intelligence systems are just amplifying and accelerating and um, automating, which was the scariest thing, something that has always been part of how we make decisions. And as a researcher, as an academic, um, I realized that uh, academia and the way that we think about truth and evidence and proof, the way that we determine what we should do based upon the choices in front of us, um, is also um, biased and and unfair. And so we need to go even further back than AI before we automate this decision system, before we hand it over to this power tool. Uh, we need to really think about what it does, especially to people who are outliers and minorities, who, who um, are either seen as noise by these machines and eliminated, um, or um, who are, are never going to be decided for because they are um, not part of the success pattern from the past. Um, and, and so there are so many things that are wrong with our decision systems. The, the optimistic part of that, I realized, or the, the, the key um, within that is that, um, if we address this uh, and if we pay attention to and hear the voices of the people who are out at that very margin, then we address a whole range of things because when you really look into it, all of the, the issues that we are facing at the moment as a world, <laughs> whether it's disparity, sustainability, all of those things have their roots in the, these patterns um, that come from ignoring um, the, the people who are not average, who have not had success in the past, who don't have the power or the popularity. Um, and so there is, a key, I think, to not just addressing the issues that are faced by people with disabilities, but the the issues that everybody is facing right now lies in attending to and making sure that the individuals who are currently mar at the very margins, who face the greatest barriers, who have difficulty with the systems that uh, we're using, um, 
that if we address those requirements, listen to them, then we're going to address a whole range of other, other problems. And on top of that came the pandemic. And with the pandemic, there was actually this opportunity to think, wait a sec, none of us are safe unless all of us are safe. Um, at, at, the, at the beginning, <laughs> um, we, we diverted away from that completely, which um, was very, very distressing um, and, and thought that we could, or some jurisdictions thought that we could just sacrifice the weak and the vulnerable and the fragile. Um, but the other realization that the pandemic brought about is that we need that fragility and vulnerability and we need to we need to concern ourselves with it and pay attention to it because that's what compels us to create a system whether it's a decision system or any other system or a policy system or a service system that's going to take care of us when we are all vulnerable or fragile and so um ever the 40 years or more actually more than 40 years that i've been in this field it's just sort of been piling on and oh, on yeah. all of these um realizations that we need to rethink our it decision systems yeah yeah we need to rethink it um it, it, neil had to um drop because his wife came at him with the broom oh just kidding uh, but he did have to drop <laughs> And so, but Antonio, I know you have a question. No, it's just to, 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 to following up is that uh, we, we know that people today that work on machine learning or artificial intelligence, they come from a specific background, they go to a specific process of training and skills that they acquired during their educational process. Uh, and, and sometimes uh, things that relate with humanities, with human relations, with sociology and anthropology is completely out of their view. Mm -hmm. And they might be really good looking at data from machine to machine, but they don't really have an understanding when the data relates to humans. So uh, how do, do we address this? And so we know that we, we cannot train overnight everyone in humanities, but how can we make sure that they are not damaging uh, things by by using these technologies that have the potential to to amplify or, or boost inequality. Yeah, and I, I would say that this pattern comes not just from AI. The pattern comes from research and academia in general. Um, in trying to defend evidence and truth, we've reduced it to quantified evidence and truth. Nothing is true unless it's it can be measured through numbers and um, it can be replicated. But uh, we seem to, for whatever reason, not comprehend that um, the humans are different um, and indifference lies our greatest asset and that's the key to our survival. So quantification and using metrics the way that we do to say that that is the only truth is actually denying that the, the very thing that is, is going to um, arrive at an approach to address the, the crises that we're in. So yes, you're right. <laughs> and I'm, I'm taking it back to the abstract and sorry for keep that I keep pulling it to there, but you are right. There are um, the um, machine learning and artificial intelligence comes out of a, a um, an engineering and computer science view of the world. Um, also out of an entrepreneurial, very um, uh, uh, monetary or <laughs> money related um, profit oriented entrepreneurship. Um, and uh, it it thereby just um, continuously powers a system that that doesn't work very well. So how do we how do we change that? Um, 
one of the things that um, I've been trying to do is uh, people claim that the reason, the rationale, the value that they're trying to gain by artificial intelligence is uh, innovation, greater innovation, that we are going to um, advance um, our GDP, that we're going to gain further profit, that we're going to create something that um, takes this trajectory that uh, we're supposed to be on, uh, that it um, will cause us to survive as, as a species um, in the exponential increase of innovation. Um, the, the point that I make there is that the, the greatest unknown territory, that unexplored territory, um, is actually out at the margins. Um, we're not going to find that innovation by talking to or listening to the complacent, the comfortable, the, the powerful, the popular. Um, they, uh, they don't need to change. Um, innovation is about change. It's about culture change as well. And so um, one of the ways in which I illustrate this is uh, Ever since I entered this field, I've been collecting data about what people require, what they need um, in order to participate fully. And it's this huge data set and it <laughs> has so many different uh, variables or facets to it that the only way that I can actually plot it is as a what, what's called a multivariate scatter plot. So a three dimensional scatter plot. And it looks like a human starburst or it looks like a starburst, <laughs> and I call it the human starburst. And the, the thing that I point out to people is you've got about 80% of the requirements uh, clustered in the middle, very close together and therefore very similar. And then 80% of that domain, that terrain is occupied by 20% of the rest of the requirements and they're very far apart. So they're very different and that's where uh, the area of disability, the, all of the disability requirements are. And because of the way we've made decisions and because of the way we design things, the 80% in the middle um, are well served. Right. Um, designs work for them. As you move away from there, designs become much more difficult. And as you get out to the um, outer edge, designs don't work. Every design, whether it's equipment, whether it's digital inclusion, whether it's policy, whether it's services. And the, the other thing that is relevant to artificial intelligence is that things that we declare that we have learned and um, that we see as truth and proof and that we you know talk about in the newspaper, the majority of women or all men or all children or anyone over 80 is true for those that group there in the middle um, becomes less accurate as you move away and is absolutely wrong for the people out at that outer edge. And so because of that, um, we have created a truth and a decision system that is gonna work in there, but is not working out there and it's creating disparity it's contributing to, um, I mean, every issue that we're facing right now. Um, so the, but the the insight and I th the argument I make for change is it's out there as well that you find innovation. That's where all of the disruptive new thoughts, approaches, choices come from. And it's those individuals who are out at that outer edge or, or who have requirements out at that outer edge who are the ones that have the, the first early warning signals of what's gonna go wrong. So we think we are going to use AI to be predictive, to tell us where's the world going? What do we need to do? How do we avoid the next crisis? But that, that's, um, we've got it all wrong because we're basing it upon the past. Right. And it's the past didn't work for everybody. Right. Yeah, exactly. And so it's the people that are out at those margins who occupy, by not by their choice, the domain where um, 
that unexplored domain that are the most vulnerable and have the earliest warning signs of this is not working, this is not going to do what you think it's going to do. And so that's the people we need to attend to. So AI needs to completely change. It's not about, I mean, the other, and I'm sorry, I'm monologuing. No, 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 we love these topics. So the other distressing thing is that um, we, we seem to think that we can fix artificial intelligence by um, addressing the, the data gaps, that it's simply that we haven't included the data of certain people here, whether it's uh, people who are BIPOC, people who um, have, um, I mean, the, the whole range of people who have, who have been excluded. Um, or that um, we, the reason why artificial intelligence decisions are biased is because human bias has entered into them. And those are two problems, but that's not going to address the issue. Um, one of the things that, one of the ways in which disability is so different from some of those other reasons why people are discriminated against, or not reasons, but um, the, the discrimination that occurs with other individuals is that um, you can't create a cluster and say, this is the data profile of somebody with a disability. Um, that people don't tend to identify um, there isn't a common characteristic, there isn't like a common language, a common skin color, a common anything. Um, it's just difference. And so the approaches that we're using to address AI bias um, don't work here. And that my, my huge fear is we're going to say, okay, here's an approach, we fixed it. Um, we know how to audit artificial intelligence systems. Um, we can do it by um, addressing a identity group that and saying um, we're going to make sure that this group is represented and that um, the uh, any human bias that has found its way into the algorithm against this group is going to be eliminated. That's not going to fix the problem. And my worry is if we say it's fixed, it's going to be even harder for someone that does, um, uh, is not served by that fix to be able to get justice and to get um, be to be treated without bias. And so, Yuta, I I agree, and that that's some of the things that I know we've been tackling too. And now we're talking about the metaverse, which is just you yeah, know, exactly. But, you know, but and and I I agree with you. I'm really scared because what I'm seeing it. The, you know, a lot of times when you're talking about these issues, that we're always an after fact. It's always after you do it. And that doesn't work. And then I've heard people say, well, designers are lazy. Well, that's I I don't think that is fair to say either. It's as you said, it is a very, very big, complex problem. And if we don't fix it, which, by the way, we're not fixing it the way we're talking about, we're going to just make things worse as we do sometimes. And also, I love the point you made that, you know, what we are missing here is the opportunity to really have in in innovations because when you make sure that that uh, woman that uses her wheelchair the way that works best for her, which a wheelchair is a tool, you know, um, you know, it's going to benefit all of society, making sure it works for her and the rest of us. And I agree with you. That's where the innovations are going to come. But what do you have any um, hope? for us that maybe we could uh, i'm really worried in society that we're creating artificial intelligence when we don't even know who we are as human beings and so i'm very very worried about that as obviously you are as well but any hope of the way we could do this right yeah so um one of the things that um well i agree with you we have to do this proactively and right from the beginning i've been saying that digital systems cannot be retrofit, they cannot be repaired. You have to um, act proactively right at the beginning because they'll morph and they'll propagate. And there's absolutely no way you're gonna stamp out all the barriers that have, have come about. Um, 
the there is there are some rays of hope in the artificial intelligence world. One of the things that we've been looking at is um, turning around or inverting the way that algorithms work. So at the moment they're called it, it's the algorithms that are making decisions about people like choosing the group of individuals that will be admitted to a university, um, choosing the people that you're going to interview from a huge pool of people, um, triaging um, medical uh, care to determine who is worth investing in, um, all of those really yeah. critical life-changing decisions. So what's happening with artificial intelligence tools right now is they're using what's called an, explo um, an exploitation algorithm. That means that um, they are taking data about what has worked in the past, what's been successful, who's been successful in this position, who's been a successful student, who has survived um, with a particular set of treatment or has a, a greater chance of survival if we give them medical care, um, or um, who is um, are the people that are not fraudulent in their tax claims or, or whatever. And um, we are deciding based on that. So here are the 10 people most likely to be successful in a job, given what we know about. Um, and so we're going to create um, this, uh, basically a monoculture um, within our workplace because we've, we're replicating that from the past. So we have been able to argue that, just that, that um, if you do it this way, you are gonna create a monoculture and a monoculture can be felled by a single blow, by a single measure. And so we're, we're trying to turn around those algorithms to say, rather than doing this, why don't we use the algorithms to explore, um, to diversify, to differentiate. Um, and so we have a, a project called ODD, Optimizing Disability Through Diversity, or with diversity, actually, not through. Um, and uh, what we're doing there is we are trying to change the direction that the algorithm goes to uh, within hiring. And we're starting with one small issue. Um, and rather than saying, okay, find me people that are like the people that are already successfully employed or that are already within that fit within the culture of my company, uh, instead find me the people who are different, who bring a different perspective, who will round out my perspective. And, it it's um, th that that <laughs> brings about a whole bunch of complex issues and um, causes us to to think about what is work. Um, how do we how do we fill positions? How do we recruit somebody? Why do we recruit somebody that way? Um, how do we view jobs? <laughs> so um, again, we've opened up a Pandora's box. Mm -hmm. But I think there's enough argument there that um, we got to do it that we can we will avoid some of the issues that companies are facing yeah no, i agree go ahead go ahead Anton. No, and and the, there are so many uh, things and examples that we can look in into cultural anthropology that we can bring to this yes you know? exactly. There, there's so much value on on that information that that can actually help to you know to bring uh, that type of information and that type of knowledge to, to build this model. So, you know, if we just look at the, exa of the examples of models of cultural leadership, we yeah. realize that can countries are so different and, and, and now some countries are more hierarchical, others are less hierarchical. So there are so many things that the, the social sciences can bring into these aspects. Yeah, but no, I think... No, yeah. And, and Antonio, I sorry, yeah, yeah, <laughs> I agree. But you know, um, and I, I'm realizing that we have probably talked about <laughs> already. But I want to, I want to, I, and I completely agree. We need to look at qualitative data. We need to look at the humanities. And but I, I think there's something wrong with the social sciences as well, because we've tried to um, replicate STEM and quantitative data. Um, it's not just about the type of data. It's not just about replacing qualitative data with quantitative uh, for da quantitative data. Um, it's also about the um, 
statistical significance, thinking that truth is in numbers. Well, what if you aren't part of the, that large set of numbers? If you are an outlier, um, social sciences, yes, they bring a richer, more fulsome set of data to the, the issue, but they still think that truth is in numbers and truth is in replication as opposed to, to seeing the truth that is in the outlier, the unusual, the, the, um, the counter um, statistical significance, the, the, uh, et cetera. So I think it's, it's, it goes beyond the, uh, you know, what, what um, replacing or adding social sciences. So, so uh, do you feel that in the overall, uh, people are somehow, one of the reasons why we are not progressing here is that people are afraid of embracing the complexity behind all this. Oh yeah, yeah. We've we have ignored and we've denied complexity, and uh, we have um, yes, definitely. And we've uh, we we push against diversity all the time, right. and I, I think there is a number of un, really unfortunate fears and myths that are propagating at the moment. We seem to think that thinking about people at the margins is like extremism, that we're letting the extremes in. But that's not the case. If you, um, at, right now in sort of the, the um, geopolitical sphere, we've got polarization. And this is because we've created these binaries. If we add a greater diversity of perspectives as opposed to reducing things to two sides, a, competi a competition between two views, then we are going to reduce extremism. I mean, it's a physical argument that, you know, physics shows us that if you have a pendulum and you keep pushing both sides, then yes, you will reach the extremes. If you start adding additional forces, it'll start to um, swing in a circle that is far less extreme. Um, the, the, there's <laughs> too much to say here, but yeah, um, the, the, we need to think of this as a complex adaptive system. It's not fixable. It's something we have to work at all the time. And the, the, we have to stop denying that humans are diverse. In that diversity, uh, diversity is our greatest asset. Inclusion is our biggest challenge and we have to be aware of complexity. If we only address our obvious problem, there are going to be friction points. We have to think about the entire um, system. So this is why um, when I established the Inclusive Design Research Center and everybody kept saying, give me the seven principles of inclusive design. I said, I I said no way, there are no seven principles. It's all relative. I'll give you three dimensions. First, recognize that everybody's different, that we're all diverse, and we are the experts in our diversity. It, 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 there, nobody else can have the expertise and tell us what we need. Secondly, that, that we need a, um, an inclusive process. Nothing about us without us. We have to continuously ask, who are we missing? We have to ask people to help us not just come to the table to help us, but to help us design a table that's going to work for everybody and to continuously say, wait a sec, I, this is what I think is the right approach, but who am I now excluding? And then thirdly, we have to be cognizant that we are existing in a complex adaptive system, that, uh, we, that what we need to strive for is benefit for all. The minute we create something that makes it harder for somebody else, the, uh, it's not going to survive. There's, there's going to be friction and uh, we're gonna have to address it again. So yes, complex adaptive system is definitely what we, <laughs> what we need to think about. And I know that we have kept you on longer, but we also could talk to you for days and days and days and years. But um, the, I want to give you the last question, the last comment to make. And, the, and also, uh, it's certainly we want to thank my clear text for keeping us on air and helping us with captioning and all of our audience. But what can our community do to support your work? Because 
I agree with what you're saying. And I'll tell you, I'm not hearing other people say this. You, um, I know I've been saying, we've been saying it, but I'm not hearing design leaders talk like you. And so I think our entire community needs to get behind you and support you. But also there's, you know, a lot of corporations. So how do we help you continue to advance this so that um, people can be included? Yeah, I, I think um, that uh, there's, there's lots of things. But the, uh, creating a community. I mean, I, um, I, I think as a community, we need to stop being um, taken in by the shiny things, right? <laughs> the place where we can make profit. Um, the the gadgets. This little checkbox right here magically makes it yeah. all accessible. Exactly. So let's stop using the word solution. Let's stop using the word fix. Is this is an approach? It's like I, I, I think um, learn from your moms. You have to keep washing the dishes every day, right? Um, <laughs> That's right. Uh, so the what we need to do is we need to think more deeply. We need to think bigger. This is a huge problem. But the the point to make is that we have we hold the key to much larger issues and um but we also are um the working i mean within our community are people who uh, will feel the 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 worst risks to come and the crises to come so let's stop obsessing with a particular fix that we have creating an industry out of it like the <laughs> of accessibility repair and uh industry and uh, look at what is coming. Um, there are so many threats on the horizon and we have to act proactively. Uh, we have to get, get in there and make sure that the right people are helping to make the decisions right from the start. And uh, artificial intelligence is just one of them. I mean, um, there are others that are emerging. The future of money, the way that um, I mean, social media and the the um, popularity echo chambers. The, uh, there's so many things right. where we should but be. This is why we need to make sure we're all supporting. It, yeah, it, exactly. We'll fix. So, yeah, yeah. So thank you so much. Thank you so much for your. I remember an article that was. I want your job. <laughs> I remember that article. That's why I knew your name. Because you do an amazing work, but. Um, well, I, I have a, an amazing community <laughs> that I, um, the people that started with me back in 1993, are, many of them are still there and it just keeps growing. So yeah. not just me. Well, we, we really, really appreciate your work. So thank you so much for being on Access Chat today. And thank so you. we'll say goodbye to the audience and we will let you to go. Go ahead, 